Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you. Uh, my name is Quentin Ring, and I am Bjorn Brooks' executive director, and I am thrilled to be, to be able to welcome all of you to our program tonight. We've got two of our favorite poets here uh, with us, Ron Kirchie and Eloise Klein-Healy. Yes. They're old friends of Beyond Baroque. Uh, they've got new books out. They're great poets, and I think we're going to have a good time. Um, but before we started, I would like to begin uh, by acknowledging our presence on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Gabrielina Tongva peoples. We acknowledge the wrong done to these peoples through settler colonialism and genocidal practices. As an arts organization, we are committed to uplifting indigenous writers and communities. Um, say a few words about Beyond Baroque as well. Uh, we are very much a space and, and a community dedicated to the artistic possibilities of language, uh, which is to say that we are a space for poets and writers. We've got writing workshops, including our free weekly Monday night fiction workshop and our Wednesday night poetry workshop. Uh, we have regular master classes, including, uh, we have a couple coming up uh, next month. One is with the poet Douglas Manuel. Another is with the poet uh, Julia Guess. I think those are on February 11th and 18th, respectively. Uh, we also have ongoing readings and performances pretty much every weekend right here in this theater. Uh, just starting, uh, just tomorrow we're launching a new series called The Haircut. That's uh, sort of a interdisciplinary series that's bringing together film, music, uh, and, and, uh, and poetry as well. Uh, we'll also have actual real haircuts. There's gonna be a barber here on site. If anybody needs a trim, come back. Yes, I need one, I've been saving it up. Um, Next Friday, we're teaming up with Kaya Press to present Jenny Liu and Patrick Coleman. And on Saturday, we've got a, sort of a mini zine fest and book launch with our friends at Errant Press. That's going to be a fun day. Much more beyond that throughout February. So please do come back. Check out our website, beyondbaroque.org. We've got a lot going on. But what we have, even beyond events and programs, is a community of people dedicated to literature and the arts. We really depend on the support of that community. Um, so if you're not a member of Beyond Baroque, um, we would absolutely love it if you became one tonight. You can uh, see Catherine or Genesis in the bookstore. They can help you out purchasing a membership. It uh, starts as little as $60 for an individual membership, $80 for a dual membership. Um, we're trying to keep our events free for now, so it helps us, uh, it helps us do that. If we do charge and you're a member, you'll still be able to get in for free. Um, and it just it means a great deal to us. We've got a lot of work to do on this space. Um, we're renovating the back patio. Um, all sorts of other spaces around the building. And so it's, it's, it's a really a big help. So please do consider becoming a member. Um, I just want to give a special thanks to everybody working on the program tonight. Uh, Jimmy Vega, Ivan Salinas, Eric Alberg, Genesis Perez, Catherine King. Um, really appreciate all of your help. Um, but beyond that, I just want to say I am really excited to hear Ron and Eloise read. Uh, it's been too long for both of them. There's been a whole pandemic that's intervened. Um, and so it's really great to be able to welcome them back into the space and celebrate their new books. Um, I will say, please do buy their books. I'm sure they'd be willing to sign them after the show. We've got them for sale in the bookstore. Um, but without further ado, I think I'm just going to introduce Ron. Uh, Ron Kirchie is a longtime resident, resident of South Pasadena taught at Pasadena City College for 37 years. A prolific writer, he has published more than 30 books of poetry and prose. Some of his recent, most recent books are Fever, The Ogre's Wife, Vampire Planet, and Olympusville. He is the recipient of grants from the NEA and the California Arts Council and has poems in two volumes of Best American Poetry. Uh, recent Pushcart Prize winner, he is also the author of Negative Space, shortlisted for an Oscar in animated short films in 2018. His new book, is I dreamed I was Emily Dickinson's boyfriend. This speaks to me. I have a whole, like a, in, a, in a previous life, a much more boring life, I have a whole unfinished dissertation on Emily Dickinson. So this is like my dream too. So please welcome Ron Kirchie. Hello, everybody. Hello. We can do better than that. Hi, everybody. Hi. There you go. Yeah, I love you. I'm happy to be back at Beyond Baroque. Um, I read here when it was the Amy Gerstler, Dennis Cooper era. Um, I went through it with Wanda Coleman early in our careers, where afterwards she called me probably the whitest white boy she'd ever seen. <laughs> I was whiter then uh, than I am now. I'm still pretty white. Um, 
I'm going to start with a new poem that um, my wife hasn't heard or seen. I don't think Kim has heard it, and Kim has heard um, a lot of the things that I've written. Um, it, it's called Going Through Their Things, and it's something that people from my generation and maybe in their 70s or 60s or 50s have gone through. Your parents pass away, and you go through their things. Um, you know, a poem like that is fraught because it's so easy to go wrong, fall into bathos, pathos, and sentimentality. So let's see if I've avoided all of that. Going through their things. Shoes that will never see another ballroom. Dresses that somehow manage to be beyond vintage. And then I find a shoebox of photographs, people I don't remember with names more difficult than mine, except for one snapshot, which I carry. My parents standing beside a black and white cow with an enormous udder. <laughs> and on the back, my mother has written me, my new husband, and cha-cha. <laughs> and here's what I want to know, mom, who named that cow after a dance none of you could do? <laughs> if you get tired of clapping, you could wait till the end. No one knows what to do about clapping. Least of all, not me. Um, for an elegy, they had, that poem had a very light touch, and I'll, I'll keep the light on for a few poems. Um, I, I write, besides poetry, I write fiction for young adults. A lot of my poems, because I'm so easygoing, have been picked up for anthologies in high school and middle school. And over the years, decades ago for these, I used to get letters from kids, middle school kids. Um, and the, the teachers would have, these are pro forma, and the teachers would have said, you have to write to an author, pick one, and just write him or her a letter. And so, you know, they're not much. But some of them were terrific and so funny and so frank. So I put them all together at one point and made like a composite letter to me from these composite students. <coughs> and the, the poem is called Dear Mr. K. Dear Mr. K, the reason I am writing is I keep seeing deeper meanings in your poems, but my friends say there's nothing there. <laughs> In that one poem where you go to the racetrack, I think the rain stands for something, but everybody says it's just rain. <laughs> you can settle things if you are kind and want to write back. I saw your picture somewhere online, and you look kind for an older, old person. <laughs> do you do anything special to not look as old as you might look if you didn't do anything? Like a vitamin, maybe? I showed my father your poems, and he said, huh? <laughs> See, that's an example of something my teacher calls compression, meaning a lot without saying a lot. Your poems are not very compressed. They are all over the place. They sprawl on the page like lazy cats. Do you like that simile? I learned it from you, sort of, and I, I agree with my father, and nobody makes similes for a living. Or maybe I'm wrong. How much do you make per year? <laughs> or even per month? Or even per simile? If that's too nosy, pretend I didn't ask. I like you as a poet. You're very simple to read compared to famous poets. <laughs> I showed my mother your poems, too. She laughed, but not at the funny one. Write back, OK, soon, if you can. My grandfather looked pretty good, like you do, but he died in church, sitting up. Well, that's all for now. It's raining outside. If I was a poet, it would probably stand for something, but I'm not, so it's just rain. Thank you. <laughs> dear Mr. K. Dear, dear Mr. K. Um... My st uh, this poem is about Red Riding Hood. 
And I, I wrote a whole book of revisited fairy tales published by my kid lit up, uh, editor Candlewick. Really a nice book, illustrations, the whole thing. So in my workshops, I'll write what my students write, and I'll, or, I'll, or I'll bring something in. If I bring in another Red Riding Hood poem, they chide me, and they say, when are you going to stop writing about these fairy tale characters? And apparently, it'll be a while before I do that. Red Redux. Red and her grandmother are content inside the wolf. It's dark and very warm. Plenty of time to chat. And Red learns how difficult her mother was as a girl and learns how her grandma had a sister who died young. Inside a wolf is the perfect place for secrets. They hold each other tight when they hear the axe in the door and the woodsman's tantrums. And here comes the part they hate. Wolf in pieces, woodsman enormous, teeth bared, bloody axe in his fists, his eyes undressing both of them at top speed. Here's a poem that's sexy without being graphic. It's called I Like to Kiss. I like to kiss up against a chain link fence. White pickets are too churchy. Wrought iron is too Victorian. I like to be outside an abandoned car lot. The weeds pushing through the concrete and the fence wrecked just enough to give a little as the kiss takes over and delirium sets in. We're still on our feet, and although that might change, I don't care. I could stand there half the night, holding on, my fingers curled in the diamond-shaped spaces. I'm breathing as hard as any punk in any movie, running from the cops who scramble up and over a chain-link fence, except I'm not going anywhere. I'm here drunk on these pitiless kisses as I claw at the fence like the animal I, for the moment, am. <laughs> Thank you, kissers. Um, I'm going to read what is probably my friend Kim's favorite poem called Peace Work from the Garment Factory. And I have to set this poem up because in my hometown, I mean, they, they were, we were mostly blue collar or no collar, if that's possible. Um, we were very poor. I was 10 uh, when this poem takes place. I didn't know from that kind of poverty. I had a roof over my head. I had three meals a day. I had my friends. So we're all 10-year-old boys. The piecework in this poem, in the garment factory, it was a big white building as you made the turn to go up toward Main Street. It was full of women running sewing machines, three stories of women working for, I don't know how much, a dollar an hour maybe. This is 1956 or earlier. So the piecework is they could take home the things they were working on and finish them there for 10 cents a piece. So when you go into somebody's house, there was this stuff. Mostly what these women were sewing were undergarments, girdles. Remember girdles? Go back with me. Uh, night, yes, no. um, nightgowns, pajamas, and brassieres. Before brassieres were called bras. So this is what you're working with. This is what you saw if you went into the garment factory. Or as in this poem, one of my friend's houses. We'd been playing ball with some kids from Webster, which turned into a fight. So we stopped by Scotty's house for Cokes, because that seemed like a good idea. And then inside, there they were, all those brassieres draped across the sewing machine and the couch and the radiator, big brassieres and little brassieres, sturdy brassieres and dainty brassieres. So he put them on. <laughs> Scotty found his mother's cigarettes. We held those in empty highball glasses. We prowled around in our brassieres, smoking and drinking, saying things we'd heard our mothers say. Things like, 
My feet are killing me. <laughs> There's not enough hours in the day. And what's he doing out till 3 a.m.? William's mother was famous for crying, so he cried. We gathered around him in our droopy brassieres. They're all bastards, we said. Selfish bastards would be better off without them. It was just another game that didn't end in a brawl. And let's get out of here, Scotty said. So we helped each other with the snaps and straps, with the hooks and the eyes. We returned the cigarettes to the pack. We even washed the glasses that our innocent lips had never touched. Um, I was reading, I, I don't work anymore. I retired a long time ago. Retired from teaching. So I write every day. And in the morning, I go up to the studio and I take the cat. I look at the Poetry Foundation. I read other people and I see if I can do what they're doing. And if I'm lucky, maybe do it better. Usually that doesn't happen. Usually I don't write all that well. But I'm reading a poem by... A, ma a man named A. Alvarez, whose work I don't know very well. And in it was the line, the uneasy trance will never break. And because I love fairy tales, I thought of Snow White. And I went back and I reread the myth of the story again. And I'll just remind you of the part that matters in this poem. She goes and she lives with the dwarves, if you remember. And the wicked queen comes time after time, tries to fool her. And then the, the, the second or third time, she gives her a poison apple, and Snow White bites it and falls into a kind of trance. The dwarves take her out, put her in a glass coffin, and she's outdoors. And that's the setting for this poem. The speaker is Snow White after she's been brought back to life. And this is her telling this story. The uneasy trance will never break. There I lay with a piece of apple caught in my throat. I wasn't dead, I wasn't alive, not in the usual sense. Trance is the perfect word, uneasy trance. I could see the same sky move from light to dark, light again, dark, always a dwarf to stand guard. They took turns like they took turns cooking and washing up. And sometimes happy polished the glass coffin Bashful looked askance, but alone with me, they bared their souls. They didn't know that I could hear. I can't repeat the things they said. They're private, beyond privacy, a privacy transmuted into mystery. They loved me truly. One kiss from any of them, and I would have sat up and yawned. Maybe they didn't want to stand on a box to do it. Maybe. They didn't know how to kiss. I was as bored as any figure in a snow globe. I was happy to see the prince. He loved me in the customary true love way. After his customary kiss, I got to take a deep breath. As I said goodbye to the dwarves, I whispered to each of them, your secrets are safe with me. They wept like children and held onto my skirt as I tore myself away. Um, and two more. Poets always announce the two-poem warning. <laughs> I always thought it was dangerous to have the two-poem warning and to say there'll just be two more in case somebody in the back row mutters, thank Christ for that. <laughs> Hasn't happened to me yet. Um, the second last poem, penultimate for those of you who like big words, uh, it's called Ceremony. I don't think, no, no one's heard me read this. Um, maybe Bianca and Kim have seen it. Um, but um, you, the situation is familiar. I don't have to set it up like I did the other poem. So, But it is a ceremony. Today my daughter comes home with a hamster. She found wrapped in a math test by a tired school teacher and destined for a janitor's indifferent cart. So we take Harry the hamster to the spot behind the green shed 
where he'll join a canary called Patsy Montana and also Cosmo the chameleon. I have to go for a shovel this time, like a real grave digger. Harry waits in his shoebox coffin, lined with a tank top her mother won't let her wear until she's older. My daughter puts on the angel wings again. She recounts how Harry didn't like leftovers, but loved the almond inside a nibbler toy. She sings, rhyming hamster and dumpster, Harry and cemetery. She assures him the bedding in paradise is from God's favorite pine tree. I lean on the shovel and remember a Buddhist teaching about death, how earth turns into water, water into fire, fire into air, into luminance, into radiance. I know, it's a lot for a little hamster. So I wish him well. I hope for an interesting rebirth. I'm sure he has accumulated merit in this life, patient with the sweaty hands of third graders, never biting with his serious teeth, but only gnawing on apple sticks before he steps into his golden wheel and runs. And finally, um, my wife and I live in a house that was used um, in the first Halloween movie. And if you know the movie, it's the house where Jamie Lee Curtis comes out with a pumpkin, goes down the block, sits on the stoop. We have visitors from all over all year. Um, so we're on the porch one night, Halloween, and my niece comes up, one of my nieces, I have like 230, I believe, <laughs> during uh, cookie time. She comes up and she's dressed in her Girl Scout outfit. That's her idea of a costume. But her little friend had her Girl Scout pants on, but a, a, an aluminum blouse and a space helmet and, you know, with aerials coming up. So, you know, those of you who write know what this is like. You think, oh, isn't there a poem here somewhere? And there turned out to be. Um, it's called Girl, <clears throat> Girl Scouts from Space. There are two characters, an Anglo girl named Willow and a Chinese American girl named Shui Ming. Willow and Shui Ming ride their bikes into the desert to earn environmental stewardship badges. They've barely settled in when a saucer lands and the girls feel dizzy and hold on to each other. A door in the craft opens and the aliens descend. They're thin with heads like volleyballs and their voices are reedy. We know, Willow, how weekends with your father and his new girlfriend are excruciating, and Shui Ming, even though you sang beautifully at the assisted living center, someone told you to go back to China. Your sighs reached us as we passed Venus. As scouts ourselves we know something about the dark machinery that runs your world. We applaud your interest in coding and horseback riding, but you have also earned the heartbreak badge. Congratulations. When you wake up, it will be pinned to your colorful sashes. Thank you. Pleasure to read to you. For Ron Kirchhoff, please. Thank you, Ron. Next up, we have Eloise Klein Healy. Uh, she is the author of many books of poetry, including Another Phase, A Wild Sur Surmise, New and Selected Poems and Recordings, and most recently, A Brilliant Loss. Um, Healy was the founding chair of the MFA in Creative Writing program at Antioch University in Los Angeles. The first poet laureate of the city of Los Angeles, she also has received several awards, including the Publishing Triangle Bill Whitehead Lifetime Achievement Award. It is always a pleasure to hear Eloise Klein Healy read, so please welcome her with a big round of applause. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Hi. What's so interesting 
when we all come here to be on Baroque and the room fills up with all of you, it's just like being an amazing, sweet, wonderful person. It's uh, so good that you're breathing this very air because we're getting it. That's really good. So anyway, I'm glad to be here and I'll have a little drink. <laughs> Okay, um, I'm saying that this book is about something that happened to me, which was a kind of unrealized thing at first, in that I lost all my language and my ability to walk and my ability to speak. I've written a lot since that time, other books that have had to struggle to relearn what a word means, to not just look at a little picture of something. And this happened to a person, actually, my, um, my teacher, a woman named Betty, she gave me a little card and it had a red circle on it. And she said, what do you think this is? She put it on the table. And I said, I don't know. And she said, what color is it? Green? She said, no, want to try it again? Red? Yes, you got that one. You got the red one. OK, but what is the food that you have? Banana? No. Fruit, yes, you have red fruit. You can eat it, yes. <laughs> Banana, I'm not sure. That's the way things worked, to relearn my language and to be able to say what was said also learning how to say it and what it meant. And this just by itself is really an incredible part about life because when you're, when you're a child, you're born with exactly the same going on. Are these me? <laughs> what is it? And that gradually works. And I think when I stopped my language, the truth is I really started over. And that's where I am now. I'm really happy to still be here because it looked like it could have been, you know, underground. <laughs> so let's start out in another one. My brain sizzled, April 2013. Because of the loss of my language, I was saying something kind of brain messed. But Colleen kept talking to me, me not knowing what I said even when I said it. My own missing ideas. Nothing mattered anymore. Nothing spoke to me about me about my sweetheart, Colleen, I was certainly missing, but alive anyway. How can I describe that right there? Twenty, page 20, down. Using my right hand, I point I can draw it. I drew Eloise, but really, it was the opposite angle. As happy as I am showing my word backwards, my point doesn't work. Missing it again. Ha! <laughs> 
how, how aphasia zipped me up. My damaged brain blocked me in a list and that unsaved me. I didn't hear what Colleen meant. I couldn't say what I said to her and that even lost me because it lost me first. Uh, my first thrill as a life was to be in the hospital. And it was a place at Northridge Hospital, rehab, level three. I don't know words well enough, but it's pretty busy to hear it then read, spelling one at a time. No matter, I'm being helped while I'm walking. My balance isn't teasing or touching me, just laughing a little. My waist is handled and guided to where my own room has a window. Don't know everything about where I lived before. No music on the ward. The nurses walking with me and were swaying, then me lying down. No music now, women not singing, nothing added up to me. Room to room each night, coughing and moaning. Some ladies cry slowly, not adding anyone on our list slowly missing me a bit, missing. Once, more than once. Huffing and puffing, Dr. Fry arrived late in the evening to visit Northridge Hospital. Fry would worry about my tragedy, already learning my brain had dropped it, lost, my ability to speak properly, gone. It was my aphasia in outer space. How could I know anything anymore? How could I know what to say? Repeat, how could I know what to say? Slurring. Colleen kept asking me a question, and when I answered, words were slipping, me slurring my language. Maybe I was tired, blurring my words. My mumbling meant some of me was missing. So here my words appeared, but not thinking aphasia meant missing. I didn't know it then, knew nothing at all. Pleasantry. My helpers could sing and sway and lead me to my bed. When I tried to laugh, it wasn't quite the problem. I had to talk and talk and walk, but I could be so funny. My hellos seemed meaningful, saying something normal. But when I think my body parts were good, some were just missing. Wearing my little out jacket, as smart as a brain, my helper wrote my name, Healy, on my L.L. Bean tag. Who put it there? Who lost me? I still have that jacket. <laughs> kind of off-white. <laughs> Okay, how about zipped me up? Did aphasia happen to me, for me? Somehow my brain box stopped and zipped me up, zipped me up. A silent list and a lift made and unleft me, but didn't even touch my heart. Stopped instead inside my hand. Didn't even leave me because it lost me first. 
didn't hear Colleen, left and lost my own way. Words talk, and the end did break. Just in case. I had to learn to remember I had always loved you. And something I remembered about me and you is about me, too. In one small line I kept missing. I thought my words were fine, the language I was speaking was wrong, but you gave me everything to save me, keep me. I spoke sideways, hedged my meanings, my brain no longer working, learning what I worked with, daily walking, smiling, laughing, trying. My affordable nouns and verbs practiced language to get my messages. Work every day, wake early, even what I missed before, I love you still. Remember things, everything more. Okay. Aphasia is not what I can't say. Gee, I wonder if I had something big. <laughs> Aphasia is not what I can't say. I know where I am, but can't call it a table. I also don't know how to say lamp or couch, chair, armoire, bathroom, dishwasher, no. I first practice what's missing in the kitchen or living room. I had to practice with my sink, 5 a.m. teapot, and dining room table near the microwave. Having practiced the den, office, bedroom, and the stars above. My list needs help. Colleen repeats it, links my words, linking the ones used before I lost it all. Did I get to darling, darling? Here we are. <laughs> well, I should first say where it says darling, darling, it's darling, comma, darling, question mark. Just to get it clear. <laughs> what, could I, what could I remind myself? Darling, I used to love meeting a new friend, but learning again to get a grip right through my heart deeper than my breath. What you and I knew, more daring, you shared me. But what flew my love away suddenly missed me. But darling, here we are. Darling, still. Oh, just today. A poem I had written yesterday truly touched me this morning, even more than before. Oh God, I'd written my new words using the right dimensions. I imagined singing or flying with the wind, letting myself unmangle again, click clack on me with my business to write what I had written lately. How else could I feel losing myself it's as necessary as writing a poem. We're gonna to go to Palm Springs. <laughs> Big thrill. Watching a couple of girls laughing loudly, splashing, swimming to the edge, it isn't only the pool. What I know is you and me her arms around me, sweet as she's warm. This is everything later, all in the bedroom, deeper than our bodies swimming to it all. OK. 
Okay, I'm getting down to pretty much closer to the end. Okay, okay, if you give me $10 a peach, I'll add one. <laughs> $20 a piece, <laughs> or raise a little more. This one is called Sustain Me. My lips touching the palm of your open hand sustain me. Cup your hand so close to my mouth that you'll feel the wild river whose bank you are. I open again the palm of my hand and you offer to keep me. Never the end, ever again. Um, this will be the last one here. I, I want to... Um, I want to re-say that this had been a really terrible experience of loss. Um, but on the other side, something as simple as aphasia is a whole lot easier if you're just keeping your work off and you really stay with it and you really do find some friends who love to learn your language. But boy, then to learn your poems again, that's like amazing and I I do want to tell you I was so happy to redo uh, what's happening here so this one will be the end and thank you very much for being here again many of you have seen before on these stairs and walking around with pals if you knew Long time I've been writing and rewriting poetry, but loving how I now understand the brilliant loss of my language. Amazing, isn't it? Saying what I thought I meant. My little statements were not the right words. How I work each day, crossing my fingers that I got me here. I'm nervous a little and happy, but I will never be the self I was. Thank you so much. Another round of applause for Eloise, please. Thank you. Thank you, Eloise. Thank you, Ron. Thank you all so much for coming. Uh, please feel free to hang out for a little while. We have some refreshments. Uh, please do buy some books. As I said, I'm sure Eloise and Ron would be happy to sign them. And uh, yeah, stick around. Have a good time. Thanks so much. Thank you.